Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley will discuss trends in data analytics from database to analyst. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management, Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. John is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management with 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. John frequently writes and speaks on a variety of technology and EIM topics. His, his information management experience is balanced between strategic technology planning, project management, and practical application of technology to business problems. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, good morning. And hello, everybody. Again? I am here. Oh, I am here. Great. Sorry. I was what? wrestling with my mute button. All right. Let's get, yeah, those mute buttons, they're tricky. They um, well, welcome back, everyone, to our December Data Insights and Analytics webinar. Oh, my gosh, Shannon and John, I cannot believe that we've gone through 11, almost 12 of these now um, for the year. So super exciting. And uh, we're excited to continue the webinar series in partnership with Dataversity next year. So although this is the last one for 2017, we will launch back quickly in January and uh, we welcome your continued active participation throughout 2018. Um, so it's been a wonderful year. But today we're talking about trends. And of course, this is a common area to explore at this time of year. I've seen lots of articles going around in terms of what's hot, what's not, what's trending up, what's trending down. And as this year closes out and the new one starts, we've thought about a way that we can bring together what we've presented in some previous webinars and also just talk about what people should be considering as they start to move into 2018 as well. And we're pulling together ideas that we uh, have seen both through our client work, what we're seeing and learning through industry exposure at key conferences. There was another uh, conference this week down in Florida. And then ideas from our peers across the industry as well. So lots of different sources of the information um, that we've pulled together today. And the way we're going to explore this is we've focused on trends like people, technology, data, and process. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through each of these areas, and we welcome your comments throughout the webinar. And then, of course, we always take questions at the end, um, and we will do our best to have time available at the end as well. And like most of our webinars, we do want to start with a polling question. So. Shannon, why don't you go ahead and open the poll? The, what we're trying to learn is how do you stay current on trends and in industry news? So do you search the internet? Do you subscribe to different channels and or publications? Um, clearly, some of you dial into webinars and attend conferences. Um, you know, do you learn from your colleagues? Do your companies have interdepartmental training? Um, maybe they have uh, data and analytics training as part of core curriculums at your organization. Um, maybe it's some combination of the above. So, all right, we've got just a few more seconds left. Hopefully everyone can participate. This is an easy question and helps us to understand how we can continue to serve you and be an educational source for you as well. 
Okay, I think we're about closed out here. All right. Do we have the answers, Shannon? The poll has ended. The suspense is terrific. I know. Ding, ding. Yep. Can you not see it? I just pushed the poll results out. Did you? I cannot see them. Am I looking at the wrong spot? Ah, now I see it. Thank there you. Go. Okay, so 13% of you chose uh, search the internet. You know, it's funny because a couple of years ago we did a, a research paper also in partnership with Dataversity. And at the time it was, uh, the topics were business intelligence uh, and data science. And at that time, a majority of people were learning via just searching the internet. So it's interesting to see how this has changed. Um, subscribing to channels or publications, attending webinars and conferences. Well, this is a pretty big category, uh, second uh, only to all of the above. Um, so I do think that, that the webinars and conferences seem to be supporting this topic area a bit more, seems like we can tell by the poll. All right, well, let's just jump into our next trend, or our first trend, excuse me. We decided to start with people because really without the people, then all of the other trends around technology, data, and process aren't fulfilled and aren't sustainable. So, uh, John, why don't you kick us off then with your thoughts around what's trending and how our audience can ride the trends. So, especially as they think about their resourcing plans for the new year, what are some of the trends and obstacles that they might be seeing and how would they want to uh, plan accordingly? Well, I'd, I'd be delighted and thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, trend discussions are always fun because, uh, you know, I mind, as Kelly said, around this time of the year, really, really uh, uh, nice to speculate on what's happening and what's going to happen. And we're doing budgets and everything is like that. But uh, you know, we're going to make sure we're a little prescriptive today, too. So uh, we'll talk about the what, and then we're going to talk about some of the reactions you might want to uh, to give to those. Uh, we put people up first deliberately. It's not something you typically see in a trend. The trends tend to be, uh, you know, technology, uh, um, uh, business uh, movements and things. But our number one topic still for our work and our number one issues, even around the big data and analytics uh, uh, with our work, is, is boiling down to people. So, of course, culture. Everyone talks about, oh, well, yeah, culture. Okay, and that has been... It, it, with that that label, the number one obstacle, and will continue to be so as organizations start to figure out where their analytic their a analytics functions sit, what uh, big data really means to them, uh, where does governance live, uh, continues to debate some things that are that that, that are, are are new to them. Um, uh, the next part of that is training, and uh, the with big data and analytics. What we hear in conjunction with uh, uh, those words is being data driven. Um, well, you know, what does that mean? Uh, organizations aren't uh, being very clear with their uh, uh, expectations because they probably don't know right off the bat what that actually means. Uh, so we're going to find this to be, this is going to be a real tough one for 2018 for leadership who have been told from some either by the market or by their board or by whatever leadership to be data driven. Uh, that, of course, boils down and into the organizational impact in terms of people's roles and people's titles. There's a lot going on in that area. There's many, many forms of analysts There's uh, that, that, that people are going to have to figure out. And um, we're even starting to hear the terms citizen data analyst, which is just any old person can be an analyst now. So. All of those, uh, uh, all of us that are listening have been probably through at least one or two iterations of technology change, and we, we this is very, very common. Who does what and what's the title? Uh, real key there, though, is the CDO, CAO, Chief Digital, Chief Data, both uh, roles needing to be clarified. We, we've seen some problems, and we see other organizations that are going to continue to struggle with 
with what are the roles of these uh, top level positions. And lastly, um, it's going to be super, super critical to have that racy or rasky mentally in your head uh, and and uh, already for uh, our pipeline for next year and from the conference I was just at in Florida last week, we're seeing uh, a lot of questions about, well, who's accountable? Uh, who has to carry this forward? And, and you're going to have to have a, a, a people plan. So along the line of prescriptive, let's just go. Kelly, if you don't have anything to add to that, we can move on to the, uh, to the next one well, and talk about how to react to that one. Yeah, you know, I thought that, that you bring up the, the citizen concept, and there's really been a lot of uh, a lot more conversation around the citizen roles, the citizen data scientists, the citizen data analysts, like you indicated. We've even seen roles like a citizen data engineer, a citizen data steward. And the idea is that the, this is a broader number of people within the organization able to perform data and analytics roles without that specialized training. So I think that that kind of rise of the citizen role um, impacts all, each of these categories. So how does that impact your culture? Um, how do we maintain um, and create a data-driven culture? And is the citizen role a response to that data-driven culture? Um, or is this sort of distributed and federated world uh, going to impact all of these different categories? So I think, you know, the foundation of this people plan and uh, ensuring that there's clarity of role uh, across a distributed and federated organization is really important. Um, and I did want to just clarify if anyone didn't ask the question around what a RACI versus a RASCI, we've also seen ACs. So RACI is responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed, and it's a way of identifying who does what within a process or an activity. The RASCI is adding the clarity around supporting roles and who supports a function. Some organizations consolidate this rather than adding an S, they remove the R and call it an AC, so accountable, consultant, informed. Anyway, just to make sure everyone's clear on what those different um, categories are. Okay, so now let's move on to how do we ride this trend? John, thoughts? Sure. Uh, well, um, th this is the fun one. Uh, so so we, we put it first, uh, actually the organization chart. Uh, um, when when we do our work, we get to the operating framework because we don't like to call that a, an organization unless you're actually really working on the organization. Uh, at event, but once you create how your capabilities will be deployed or what capabilities will be deployed, um, the org chart all, always comes up. And this is not going to change at all, all into 18 and probably in the 19th. And the real key here is if you're going to be data driven and really get serious about it, Depending on your industry and your culture, you might see more than one need to do some reorganizations. So please just be open-minded uh, uh, to that. Um, there is, you know, we, we've, um, uh, roles are going to continue to evolve in conjunction with that. You will have new job descriptions. So uh, if you are connected with human resources or, uh, you know, um, uh, get them ready. If you're not, start to groom a relationship with human resources if you're becoming data-driven or analytics and big data are playing a more prominent role in your organization. Because there, there are when you start to add uh, attached to the RACI and the RASCI uh, charts, you're adding new accountabilities. New accountabilities means different performance measures, et cetera, et cetera. You can see all that daisy chains into uh, a human capital issue. Um, the collaboration and cooperation between IT and business, we all know that that's always there. It's, it's, it's becoming more prominent, and that means work to improve collaboration and working together. All right, so collaboration is a little different than cooperation. Cooperation is kind of working together. Collaboration is working together, but having an agreement really that if, if one party doesn't agree, you still have a way to go forward. Um, and and uh, uh, that's something area to kind of get yourself ready to, to 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 deal with. That's a mindset to have rolling into 2018. Um, 
and of course uh, uh, the sustaining plan or the organization change management or whatever. When you go to being data driven, when you start to rely more on data as a monetization, either as a revenue source or an expense manager, when you're bringing data into much more prominence, um, you're making changes. And changes, uh, uh, just to recap really quick, we've said this many times before on, on our series here, three things happen when change happens and two of those things are not what you want to happen. So uh, you don't want to end up where you started and you don't want to end up taking an entirely different path uh, and giving up on, on the cause. Um, you want to move forward to a data-driven world. So um, if you don't have a sustaining plan for your big data program or you have kind of a, a light training thing and, and there is no uh, a, a thought about um, how do we uh, embed this into our culture to be thinking about data on a day-to-day -day basis in addition to processes and stuff? It's time to get that ready to go. You will need that in 2018. Um, these, uh, just a quick story, and I, I think uh, Kelly will probably have some more to share uh, here after mine. We have seen several times uh, in the past year and are actually working with uh, a few now on into next year where uh, the chief data officer is really a chief analytics officer and, in, you know, in one case it works kind of okay because um, the organization had no expectations. In another case, the expectation was the chief data officer was going to manage the entire data asset, but they only concentrated on analytics and everyone was uh, kind of confused there for a while. Um, so uh, um, um, spending some time on the people stuff is going to be really, really important. Kelly, back to you for another story or, or your additional comments. Yeah, so I think that the uh, this concept of the chief data officer, which now is um, across probably a majority of organizations, have the concept of a chief data officer or a top data job. Um, now with the advent of the chief analytics officer, and then as was mentioned in the previous slide, a chief digital officer, there is a potential for confusion and uh, for some battling for um, seniority amongst those three different roles and which one uh, is subsumed under the other role. So I think that that's important to understand in, in this revisiting of the org chart uh, around what works and, and uh, what is going to be most sustainable. I think the other thing that when we're thinking about org charts and we're also thinking about IT and business collaboration, it seems that it's collaboration, cooperation, but also some of these roles that are traditionally business or traditionally IT seem to be starting to merging or starting to merge or blending. John, are you seeing that too? Yeah, I am seeing a muddying of the waters between what business traditionally has done and IT has traditionally done. Um, from from a prescriptive standpoint, it's it's uh, kind of connected with this uh, collaboration thing. Mm -hmm. In some organizations, business has taken over what would have been traditionally data things because they're tired of waiting or impatient, and there there is some friction, okay, mm -hmm. between the two. And others, uh, IT has uh, more or less uh, stepped back and said, we are going to be the wires and fires and the plumbers and the movers of, of, of things like that. And you do what you need to with the data. Um, there are pros and cons to both of them uh, and both of those approaches. And uh, again, spending some formal time on how you're going to connect the two is really, really important. And I, I think from an encouraging note here, um, uh, uh, I um, uh, was listening to a speaker this week who, who was, had a great style and everything was presented in a positive note. You know, uh, um, uh, and I kind of got inspired by some of that. So in a positive note, um, uh, um, we, should, we should understand that those lines between IT and business are blurring. And by the way, they've never been separate businesses within your business. They're just different departments and everyone's paycheck says the same thing up in the corner of, of the document. So, so um, it pays to get everyone on the same team and take conscious efforts to do that. 
Now, we've been saying that for years, but in 2018, it's going to become really visibly important to do that. Yeah, I would agree. And I think it is more so now than ever and people being comfortable with a technical role within the business, uh, a business role within technology, et cetera. And it's also, I feel, interesting that the educational institutions are starting to support this view as well in the sense that the analytics programs are not necessarily within the computer science department. So we've got some affiliations with some schools and one of the schools we're affiliated with their analytics program is underneath their marketing line of study. Another um, school has their analytics program under their, you know, continuing liberal arts and professional uh, studies. Not So not necessarily business, but not technology or computer science either. So I, I find that that whole blending of capability is really interesting although our organizational structures still tend to be hierarchical and departmentally driven. So yeah. anyway, yeah. Yeah. food the for thought on that one. Changing. Org charts <laughs> are changing, for sure. They sure will be, yes, okay. Onward, Onward and upward, here we Onward. go. Onward, so let's talk about technology. So uh, lots of folks on this line are really interested in the new technical trends and that sort of thing. This is an area that uh, keeps us all on our toes because there seem to be emerging technologies and vendors uh, consistently um, throughout the year and uh, talking about what's coming up and what's uh, going down is always very time dependent because give us another month and it might change. Anyway, yeah. John, what are you seeing out there? Well, um, this one is so cool. I think we actually have two pages of trends. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, um, database technology. That this one, I put. You know, I put this one first. We mm -hmm. we kicked this around. We said, yeah, let's do that first. Mm -hmm. um, things like graph databases are, are going to require you to really open your mind. Uh, you know, Hadoop was a bit of a mind bend for folks, but everyone kind of got their head around it. Now here comes graph, and now you're starting to see a real strong likelihood that that if you haven't um, uh, gotten your head around it, you're going to have more than one type of database technology, not just different vendors with the same type, but different architectures, uh, you're going to have those. So you're going to have um, that. And, and, you know, the cool thing is about Graph is that Graph is going to be probably the go-to ways of controlling your vocabularies, your semantics, your navigation around data lakes and things like that. Uh, um, uh, and we have some prescriptive stuff coming up here on how to deal with that. Blockchain, uh, what did I see this morning? Bitcoin, 19, no, 12,000, something like that. It's coming <laughs> just ridiculous. Anyway, the technology, I'm not talking about Bitcoin today, but the technology behind that um, is going to continue to expand in its application. So uh, um, you need to be exploring that. You, this blockchain will become a part of your architecture in the future. Now, there's not a lot of examples now. Um, so this is one of those things, this is a fun trend. We can go study something and maybe not be held accountable for it quite yet, okay? Um, but but the, uh, I, I had uh, talks with, um, at various times with uh, some of our peers, like uh, Len Silverston over uh, this week, um, Malcolm kind of dropped in, um, several other folks, uh, and um, we all ended up coming to, uh, does blockchain do this, does blockchain do that, how does it do that, why are they mining for blockchain? All these questions are running around, and everyone has a quasi-accurate answer, but nobody has it nailed down. But th th this technology is powerful uh, and has a lot of different things that can go, not much, not unlike relational math when uh, EFCOD uh, and DATE started to, to come out with the relational aspects of things. At, at, at the beginning, nobody knew what to do. Some of you folks aren't that old. At the beginning, nobody knew what to do with the relational database. It was a truly foreign concept. Now, you know, now it's, 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 it's pretty standard. Um, the moving on, the predictive analytics as an enterprise capability will grow. Uh, predictive analytics have been there for a long, long time. Organizations have always been doing those, uh, this type of work. But um, uh, uh, as an embedded relying on, you know, data telling us what to do 
is becoming culturally accepted. Uh, so that's going to just continue to embed itself, even in companies you, you wouldn't have thought about it. The Internet of Things, um, lots and lots of data from lots and lots of places means handling and stuff really, really fast. And so, of course, your technology is going to have to be able to uh, drink from a fire hose, uh, such as it is. Um, Kelly, anything on this page or what can just flip on? Yeah, you know, I think one of the other things about the Internet of Things is, uh, yes, the need for speed and, and uh, uh, companies were putting everything on the Internet, you know, whether it's the Nest, you know, technology, whether it's your car, what have you. But one of the things that this has also created is an awareness and acknowledgement of the need for greater security, because in the rush to put so many devices on the Internet, many security gaps were not properly closed. And so it's uh, the Internet of Things, I think, is, you know, it might change in terms of where it, it's placed on our, our trend chart for next year. In fact, I've read some articles that, in which people are saying that the Internet of Things is falling off the rising trend and is now in the not hot category based on some of these security mm -hmm. uh, risks associated with it. So anyway, I think that's very interesting. Um, okay, next page of technology. Yeah, yeah. AI and machine learning. Um, well, if you want to sound smart at a cocktail party now, say AI, right, or or machine learning. Um, it's coming mainstream, but uh, everyone, you know, you can get to uh, in a in a handful of people. Someone thinks, no, we can't do this. It's Skynet, and we don't want to do that. And uh, so for those of you that are not science fiction inclined, Skynet is the evil um, uh, machines taking over the world from the Terminator movies. So yeah. Anyway, um, uh, it shows what I do in my spare time. Anyway, um, uh, but, you know, there's really good stuff. On the other end, are people saying, no, it just can't, it's impossible, can't, you know, can't happen. This is just sophisticated algorithms. It's just heuristic math, things like that. The point here is that uh, it's not going to go away. And, and you've got to start to understand this. For example, the difference between AI and machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI. They're not two different things. Um, there's lots of AI. You can do a lot of AI type things without doing machine learning. All right. I mean, that is, uh, and you can, uh, or you can focus on uh, uh, machine learning. Um, there's all kinds of different flavors going on out there. Um, we have two, two of our two trends down as cognitive. That's probably could be, and there's a gray area between those. You could even consider that. There, but anyway, mm -hmm. more consideration. The data lake, data lake is now part of your architectural toolkit. All right. So the the, the trend next year isn't oh people will use data lakes. That's gone. Data lakes are here. All right. But they're going to evolve much the way the data warehouse evolved when you had you know data warehouses. Then you had data marts. We have data lakes now. We have these regions or zones within the data lakes. All right. You're already seeing that. Uh, we had. Uh, um, then as data warehouses, then we had data warehouse 2.0 and corporate information factories, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. All this is going to happen. The tools to manage this are going to happen. And you probably in 18, even if you've already done data lake and have something up and running, things are going to be happening so fast that I would say maybe by second or by third or fourth quarter, if you've got a data lake that's been up and running for a couple of years, you're going to start to consider a generation two of your data lake. Things are happening that fast out there. Um, cognitive learning uh, will enter the vocabulary of enterprise architects. So in other words, uh, are we willing to have algorithms look at things and recommend new things to us uh, and, and things like pattern recognition and facial recognition and things like that? Are we willing to take that dive into pushing some control off to the algorithm? Um, and you're going to see, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. You know, we're, we're going to do that. And of course, you know, as, as a data governance person or, or an analytics person, whatever, what's that mean? What can we do with it? You've got to understand that stuff. Uh, overall technologies in general, we've, we've experienced, um, uh, Kelly and I have, have joked about this. We've, and, 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 and amongst our peers, uh, every time you come out, you turn around, there's a new name that, sounds kind of silly, you know, like a splunk or a scoop, and it's spelled funny, and it has missing vowels and stuff like that. But, um, and, and, and you feel like you need a scorecard to do this, but 
these are all various shades of things that are were added on to the old core Hadoop through the Adobe stuff to to do different things. Well, you're going to start to see things get more general and things become more uh, uh, less purpose built and more general, more mainstream, much like our modern DBMS uh, uh, prior to Hadoop technologies were. And you're starting going to start to see more. Yeah, and uh, inevitably with all the vendors entering here, you're going to see consolidation and things going and things merging and, and all of those kinds of things too. So there's a lot. Uh, uh, um, that's like, well, two pages for technology. That's the only <laughs> thing today we've had two pages on, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Hadoop used to be the answer to every big data question, right? And, you know, there were so many add-ons required. It became really confusing, costly to manage. You know, I think this concept of, you know, both the combination of the database management tools evolving and technology swinging back to being more general is those providers of solutions, you know, technology solutions or, or um, combined technologies that are coming into a solution will really start to gain traction as companies are wanting to simplify, you know, their costs for managing their infrastructure. So I think some of these are, are very related um, for sure. Yeah, so then, you know, what are we seeing around riding some of these trends, John? How do folks take advantage of it? Uh, well, um, uh, I, I, the first one, I, I, and, 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 and I'm doing this now, uh, working with um, uh, a good friend here in St. Louis, a um, good friend of our firm who's, 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 who's into this, and he um, is showing us stuff with, with graphs that's pretty, pretty uh, incredible. Having a knowledge map for your organization is going to be vital. Um, so uh, if you don't know about graph technology, um, you've got to get yourself educated on it. I, I, I would say of all the things we've talked about, I, I, this way as a mandate, if I were a CIO or a CDO, I would be spinning up capability in this area as an R&D basis before anything else, uh, honestly. It's, it's just that, you know, it does really cool things, and, and, and uh, it's going to be a vital element of, of metadata tools. You've got vendors out there that are starting to literally gut their tool set and take out the relational, the relational engine and the relational metadata models and insert graph engines and graph aware metadata models. That's how important that this is going. So you've got to get onto it. The next thing in terms of all the speed and everything, I mean, look, machines are going to run faster and faster and faster, but it's going to have all this volume. And, and I use the phrase drinking out of a fire hose, and I use that with great deliberation. Um, <clears throat> everything's going to want to happen faster and faster, and machines are going to be able to do it, but you've still got to squeeze all these all this data down into something that's meaningful to use. So edge computing is going to be uh, um, uh, significant. And if you're not sure what that is, it's, it's going out to where, on the Internet of Things, going out to where you're getting the data collected and doing some data management all the way out in the what you would call the data hinterland before it even gets to the core lake or, or anything like that. So you're distributing your your big data uh, processing. And then of course the last thing I think we like to get uh, uh, well we had we have what's well, not the last thing because we have two pages of technology friends <laughs> That's too. Right. Um, but but the last thing on this page is the blockchain. Um, uh, that is one of those rare things, Kelly, I think that we, we have a solution looking for a problem, you know? And and there's somebody in your organization who's really smart is going to look at that, understand it, and say, we can use it here, whether it's for, for compliance, um, whether it's for security, whether it's for, for, for privacy, um, uh, uh, whether it's for uh, um, uh, managing uh, Internet of Things data, uh, um, there are a lot of folks kicking around a lot of uses of this, so please get smarter uh, on that. Um, Absolutely. You know, we, we had a client that uh, um, geared up for real-time analytics. They got all, everything they were supposed to get, Spark and uh, all the tools to go with it. And um, then they discovered that, you know, be careful what you ask for. My grandmother used to tell me that. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. And they got all set up, and then here it comes, you know, 20 terabyte a day, boom, just coming in. 
no idea what to do with all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he couldn't even process it. Then, um, then the other thing on the other side, a positive thing, we had a client that was um, uh, uh, just started to dabble with things and had a sandbox and used some fairly primitive tools, but did use a uh, Hadoop and a, and, a, and a data lake type construct and started to run some AI type algorithms and found some profound uh, high return reshaping of its business processes. Uh, and um, again, uh, they what they did was kind of what we're encouraging you to do here is spend some time thinking about what kind of solutions uh, you can bring to bear on, on, on your problems, but you're going to have to get uh, smarter on them. Over yeah. to you, Kelly, or on to Yeah, you know, just to, to piggyback on top of the first bullet point, um, I heard a presentation recently from a fellow named Tim Baker at Thomson Reuters about how they were leveraging graph databases and knowledge graphs to better understand their content repositories. So exactly what you're talking about here in terms of graph database technology to give us a much better view of metadata and give it to us in a way that's much more consumable and quickly consumable so that we truly understand what are the data elements, what are the relationships to other data elements, where are they in our organization, how are they consumed, and, and a lot of information that's best represented via a graph. Uh, so anyway, just piggybacking off on that. So we do have a second page of trends, so let's jump to that second page of trends and Alrighty. we can talk a bit more about the AI and machine learning on this one as well. Oh, and I did forget to mention our friend here in St. Louis, John Singer, is is, is becoming a, he has many, um, by the way, John has some stuff on, on data diversity. Fabulous. Our, our kind hosts. There you go. Um, uh, uh, tracking and monitoring about the data lake. Again, um, uh, I'm not much of a sports fan, but when I do sit and watch sports, I actually like to watch American baseball, and which a lot of people think is like watching paint dry. But I find it a, a good a good afternoon to to relax. And the reason I'm using a baseball analogy is in the 1980s, the coach of the St. Louis Baseball Cardinals was Whitey Herzog, and he played a very active, dynamic game and moved people out and moved the pitcher to right field and the right field to the pitcher and just and and it became a part of baseball lore that you didn't you had to run a scorecard or a tally sheet to know who was playing where when when you watched this man coach a baseball team. And it reminds me a lot of data lake and big data technology. You have got to stay awake. If you go out for a hot dog and come back, everybody's moved around the field, all right? <laughs> you know, so you've got to be really uh, on that. Um, the, the other thing is kind of tied to the story I just told there is be serious about your late, late latency requirements. You know, latency being the time from when you, uh, some data is available to, to when you really want to use it and do something with it. Um, there's everyone saying, yes, we're going to be real time. It would be no idea really what that entails, All right? You know, do your business processes require to be that real time? Do you have the controls in place that will allow you to be real time? You would, the last thing you want to do is make a really horrible decision faster than you've made a horrible decision ever mm -hmm. before, right? You don't, you know that. So, um, you might want to say, let's hold off on being aggressive on low latency stuff. Let's hold off on some other things uh, 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 as, as a way to uh, do this. And then the last one was, what does AI and machine learning really mean to you? And define what you can do with it. And again, if you don't have a strategy, or, or not so much a strategy, Kelly, I, I guess a, a, almost a position paper, right? Or, or a white paper on how to deal with these technologies, AI, big data, cognitive learning, uh, machine learning, uh, um, uh, edge computing, you need to, to sit and think about this. This is one of these, we can very, very often, two things happen. Um, and if there's a third, Kelly, just chime in. But right now, two things happen. One, you go ahead and get stuff because you have a vague notion that you're going to do it, and then when you buy all the stuff and start to do it, you realize that that notion was too vague and you are not at all ready to exploit that technology. The second thing is you don't consciously think about it. You end up uh, kicking the can down the road unintentionally 
And so when you do need the technology, you are now a laggard. Everyone else in the neighborhood has it, and you're scrambling to get it in. And of course, the price has gone up because the demand's gone up, and you can't find enough people because everyone's hired all the people you could have hired. So with all of these, you've got to get smarter and get yourself prepared. Uh, and considering these things proactively, even if the answer is to wait or the answer is to accelerate, you've got to talk about this stuff now. Talk absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think that there's, we're seeing some practical applications of artificial intelligence via robotic process automation or RPA in which companies are uh, automating some really time consuming processes that need a level of smarts that can be done via uh, artificial intelligence, but at the same time are uh, repetitive enough that it is easily tested and implementable without a massive uh, infrastructure. And then I think the tools vendors legitimately are trying to make this easier for people. And, you know, if we're looking at some of the applications of things like AI, machine learning, cognitive learning, you know, Microsoft's coming out with these cognitive toolkits. Um, you know, TensorFlow, which is an open source neural networks and deep neural networks capability, you know, et cetera. So the, the vendors are also helping people make it easier to test and see, is this something that we want to do or is this something that we're going to table for later? So anyway, I know that we're uh, talking quite a bit. We've got two more topics to cover. So let's go ahead and jump into yeah. really the implications of not just the people and the technology, but the actual data. What are we yeah. seeing on the actual data? This, this, this one is, is fun because uh, um, everyone, everyone wants to monetize their data in some way. Um, uh, so many things are pointing to a trend that more and more uh, attempts are going to be made to actually make money or save considerable money off your data. Um, uh, you know, our friend Doug Laney at Gartner just wrote a book on infonomics and he talks about monetizing data and that's what the book's about and it's it has sold more than any other book in our 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 area of thought than than, than you can possibly imagine it's it you know we're you know you're going to have more data sources everyone is going to try to make a few dollars or save a few dollars off their data and 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 um we'll, we'll talk about how to deal with that then we have the regulations those are not going to go away we're not going to see a decrease in regulations you're going to see increase regardless of what political winds are blowing whichever way uh, because of the pervasiveness of personal data flying around you're going to see more and more and more and more and it's going to require more rigorous understanding of your data uh, uh, landscape um, um, we're starting to use the word smart data instead of big data and that means make your big data actionable will be smarter um, uh, you know, do your, don't just do a data lake architecture because everyone else is. Do an architecture that's appropriate for, for you. This goes back to some of the things we said in some of our first uh, uh, um, events uh, this year. Um, make what you have actionable. You're going to see more and more demand on the sandboxes and the data scientists. Thank you. That was really cool. That was a nice report. We got a couple of good nuggets. Now, what can I have that I can use day in and day out? And uh, then the internet is the thing, of course, more and more data sources, more and more data volumes. Um, uh, some of it's probably silly. I don't want my refrigerator to talk to the internet, but it's going to, okay. Um, and you're gonna have to figure a way uh, to deal with that. Absolutely, I would agree, and I think if we, um, from a data sources perspective, there are so many more specialized data sources now. You can buy a highly specific data source to solve any so or many types of questions that you have within your organization. And I think based on the volume of new entrants into the data services market, the big players uh, are starting to feel some pressure. I had a client uh, say to me yesterday, you know, look, these guys are really putting pressure on us and they're becoming much more demanding and they're expecting us to manage their data and essentially uh, um, put together processes that enable them to audit us more easily and charge us more money. So they're becoming aggressive. So I do think that the 
uh, as we see more companies monetizing their data, uh, selling their data, that this is going to continue to happen until we hit saturation point. And then, of course, it'll go back the other direction. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we want to do about it? Well, um, if you're going to monetize data, and that's either selling it or using uh, another, because another definition of monetizing data is, is, is directly using it to manage and lower uh, costs, okay? Mm -hmm. So whatever one you're going to do, you are in essence making data a product. So product management practices, really, really important. Um, that means data quality. You're never going to avoid that. Quit trying to. It's going to be there. Um, that means having a product manager for your new data source. Um, we've got several clients that have found data they can monetize and are selling it into their market and into their customer base. And they're finding, okay, yeah, they're interested in it, but you know what, you gotta have a support line, you have to have a release strategy, you have to have a good pricing card, um, you know, you've gotta have salespeople that understand what they're doing. I mean, you know, it basically productionize this. Um, you need to have really good governance and really clear policies over your buying of the data. As Kelly was just inferring to, the data vendors are starting to get a bit belligerent about some things. Um, I don't think that will last a long time, uh, like Kelly does, but I, th there is going to be a period of time that says, hey, we've got this data and it doesn't matter what you think, you know, take it or leave it. Um, uh, so um, if you've got cloud storage agreements uh, moving on in the next year or they're coming up for renewal, time to take a hard look at them. Um, if you're going to have regulation, you need to know your data landscape. Now this ties back to our tech trend of graph databases. You have got to have metadata, you have got to have a data landscape, which is where is it, where is it sitting, how much is it, who put it there, and who looked at it. You have got to have that. Uh, without that, you are, you you risk, uh, this is a bit bold, Kelly, and you know, dampen me down if I have to, but there's some <laughs> organizations without this risk, risk becoming non-competitive in their markets. Um, and then be smart data, and you know, this is, oh, we're going to do big data, we're going to do big data. Um, use the words if that's what the boss wants to hear. But really, be smart, all right? What is your data strategy? Um, what is your data portfolio to look like? And, and, and what is your data architecture? And make sure it matches what your data strategy is, which reflects, of course, what your business strategy. Uh, um, uh, too many CIOs, as our, my story for this one, is pretty, pretty, um, um, uh, uh, is pretty broad. Too many CIOs are saying, we're going to go in this direction with data because they have this uh, uh, fuzzy image in their head of doing really cool things with the data. It's gotta be tighter than that. It's, it's gotta be a lot uh, tighter than that. Um, I'll kick that back to you, Kelly, for some additional thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when we're thinking about reviewing things like cloud storage agreements, um, you know, that also comes into play with some of the regulatory environments in the sense that the the general data protection uh, regulation does apply to, you know, where you're storing your data and you need to understand what those storage providers are promising you around the data. And so uh, I think thinking about data not just as a repository, but we need to be looking at contracts. We need to be looking at agreements. We need to be looking at what we have, uh, what we are authorized to use that data for, um, what our vendors are doing for us within that agreement. And so that's a new process, I think, that, that's happening more regularly now within organizations. Speaking of process, let's go to our last and final section where we talk about that kind of supporting uh, practice or structure for all things that we do to make it sustainable. So, John, what are some of the trends that you're seeing from a process perspective? Well, um, uh, 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 Digital transformation, that's kind of it's almost buzzwordy, but it's going to keep happening. In, in, in 18, uh, being data driven, um, uh, monetizing data, uh, moving more into uh, mobile expressions of your organization, um, uh, pushing interactions deeper and deeper into mobile type things, um, uh, understanding what's going on out there via social media, all of these types of things becoming less of an, it's not that they're going to grow, we know that, it's going to become less of an option because just everyone else is doing that. Of course, that points to other types of innov innovation. Now, 
a lot of innovation has been the one-off data scientist kind of Yahoo moment, right? Um, but you're, you're going to start to see, because this is what really uh, uh, keeps organizations moving forward, it's not just the innovative uh, one bright point of light, but it's that ongoing efficiency and sustainability of a new product or a new program or a new service. That's really, really uh, cool. So uh, start to look for innovation being a little bit more um, on that sustainable efficiency thing. Data monetization needs new processes because you're going to have new data products and data-centric programs, which are going to have different goals and objectives. Um, so all of that's going to drive new processes. Just accept it, folks. Uh, you can't do business as usual with data the way you've done business as usual. You've got to change some things. And lastly, good old data governance. We, a day without data governance is like a day without sunshine. Okay. <laughs> you, you, it is a requirement. Please just, if there's any executives listening to this, just accept it. Quit asking people to do ROIs. All right, really? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit on a soapbox here. But it is a requirement. It's, it's no different than, you know, you're doing all this, you're investing all this money, you're going to try to get all this out of data. You want to be data driven. You want all this stuff, but you want no controls. You want no accountabilities to find. You want no rules. You know, try doing that with building a new factory that, that uses a few chemicals and a complex supply chain. See what you can get away with that, with, with that same mindset. It's just not data governance is required, folks. Whatever you call it, call it whatever you want to, but having the rules of engagement with your data. Really, really important, not going away. All righty, the trend, the process, anything else, Kelly? And then we'll just start to wrap yeah. up and get close. No, to I the... think that, that this ties it, this really ties it all together. And all of these different processes are linked together to make sure that you are becoming data driven. And I love this concept of being data driven. It's becoming so much more pervasive in our culture and in our vocabulary. Um, in fact, yesterday I was listening to a presentation of a, of a, um, uh, kind of a, a business colleague of mine that is uh, runs a less than $200 million alarm business uh, here in the Bay Area. And he had a slide talking about data-driven. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. And so this doesn't have anything to do with the size of your company or anything like that. The idea is that using what you have available to you from a data perspective will make you more competitive and more efficient. It will help you innovate. It will help you monetize. And then, of course, governance is really making sure that you're understanding it. So I do feel like all these process trends are really tied together. So uh, how do we take advantage of them then? Let's go on to the yeah. wrapping up some of these slides. Uh, um, yeah, because it's the holidays. I have to go shopping. No. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, put data driven into your annual planning. Uh, if, you're, if, if those words are being kicked around, the way to get serious is say, you know, and everyone's doing it at this time of year anyway, pretty much, right, is what's it mean? How does that instantiate itself in our annual uh, financial objectives or market objectives or strategies or initiatives we're planning, what we're budgeting for, what we're resourcing for? Um, put someone who really knows data into the planning process. Um, too many of us still react to uh, budgets and annual plans. So the data governance people sit there, the door opens, out comes the big stack. Here's our annual plan. Now tell us how governance is going to deal with it. That's actually kind of backwards. The governance people should be behind those doors telling you that, well, that's not a really good idea to do to fund two separate projects that deal with customer data. Why don't you make it one separate project, right? Um, be flexible with product procurement. Um, Everyone out there probably pretty much talking to you has a procurement department. They procure a certain way, and um, you're going to get challenged on that. If it takes you 12 months to get a product bought and in place, it'll be obsolete by the time you're done. Uh, kind of pass that off the line. Um, uh, uh, you're going to have some flexibility with uh, these products. Uh, thing. Lastly, for a data person to say this, Kelly, I hope you understand it. For me to say this is almost painful, but... Start thinking about process design. Um, <laughs> uh, I know when you, you're, you're monetizing data, data governance, standing up all these new capabilities means new workflows, and new workflows equals new process, and that means think about 
processes. Those of you that have thought, well, I'd never have to go back to Six Sigma or ISO 9000 or Lean, guess what? It's, it's here. You've got to start to think about that stuff. And then lastly, uh, governance has to be adapted to be a bit more agile. One criticism we've noticed here, and some of it's valid and which is going to have to change next year, and, and you're going to hear more and more of this out of the markets, is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a quicker, quicker time to solution in the data governance area as well, uh, just simply because things are changing so fast. So if you are thinking of taking three years to stand up a data governance program and nine months before anything visible is, is, is uh, uh, from the data governance is going to happen, you better rethink those plans. Um, you're going to have to uh, get a bit more iterative and start to carve up in smaller pieces uh, there. And I'll, I'll turn that back over to Kelly on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, best, the way to take advantage of this is to really integrate the data requirements with the process requirements so that you're leveraging your technology and that you have this people plan that supports all of it. And all of this needs to be uh, supporting a dynamic environment. Your businesses are dynamic. The industry is dynamic. And so thinking about taking a long time to start governing data or to start uh, ensuring there's data understanding means that you're not going to be supporting the needs of your enterprise because even some of those traditionally uh, stayed types of industries are becoming, are seeing the need to be competitive around data, um, manufacturing, steel companies, et cetera. So with that, let's just summarize our key takeaways. And uh, if we've got any questions, we'll probably yeah. still have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, we've got, we've got one or two that have come in, and, and I've already started to form some things on, on those. So uh, takeaway that uh, – oh, you do – you, who's got you the takeaways? You want me to do the TTA? I'll do yeah, the yeah, key takeaways. Not, yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and you can monitor questions. So people issues are really still the main challenge in the sense that if we are going to create a data-driven culture, then we need to make sure that we are helping our people understand what it means to be data-driven. We're providing the correct training. We're understanding how their role fits into how they create, consume data. Uh, so the people issues around this are still really the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity. Um, the diagram on the right-hand side is a great way to think about this in the sense that the severity of the challenges versus our ability to rise to the challenge. It's hard to rise to people challenges sometimes. Um, there's personalities, there's relationships, there's commitment. So it's, it's both the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity. Um, technology, this, uh, you know, as usual, the technology industry is extraordinarily dynamic and changing which means that you will then need to be able to respond accordingly and adapt your uh, infrastructure, your architecture, et cetera, in a way that isn't chaotic, but is able to be flexible and uh, where you can respond quickly to those new demands in the dynamic uh, environment. And it's, um, you know, we talked a lot about business and IT collaboration, but it's kind of internal versus external as well in the sense that you're seeing collaboration also amongst um, uh, industry and that sort of thing. And so uh, internal processes, external processes, products that we're using internally that we're sharing amongst industry peers, that will continue to evolve. And then, of course, the data that comes out of those uh, shared processes and shared systems are now becoming monetized. So that's going to continue to evolve. And this drives towards recognizing your true requirements for speed, latency, security, and governance around data is really going to drive the business outcomes uh, that you're looking for. Questions? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I've got it. I've got them lined up here. We've got uh, a handful. We're going to be able to get to just uh, some of them. I'll take the first one here. Could you sure. define graph database technology in a couple of sentences? Well, the 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 official de de definition of the graph database is a database using graph structures for semantic queries. Now, first of all, that's a cheeseburger definition, and second of all, it doesn't really help anybody because graph databases are kind of a whole new way of thinking about data if you're embedded in the relational world. 
So real mm -hmm. short, graph databases are, are a particular type of structure and database mathematics that will allow n number of dimensions on a data element. Relational is a row and a column. Graph database is almost an infinite number of dimensions that are called tuples, okay? Graph databases came out of the semantic web world. Um, uh, uh, the aforementioned guy, John Singer, has a lot of good articles on graph, on data diversity. I would encourage you to go there. If you want to get a product sniff, there's an open source product called Neo4j. You can download kind of a play version of that and have some fun with it. And that'll be our quick answer to that. Next one, Kelly, I'll let you take a shot at it, but you and I both could just have this stuff. Uh, this is a great one. We get this one all the time. Data governance initiatives are often considered exercises in fatigue management. I like that. If data is supposed to always be owned by the business, but after the time they stop attending committee meetings, gee, does that happen? Um, uh, Guys, um, great. And we are right at the top of the hour, so if we can just wrap it up really quick with that qu very quick all answer. <laughs> we'll all right, get Kelly, 30-second answer, to you. Kelly. Um, yep. I would say focus on what the business needs and requires from their data to increase their revenue, reduce their costs, and reduce their risk, because they will not get fatigued if they're seeing value from it. And that helps to answer the next question, which is recommendations related to data governance. Find the business purpose and execute according to what's going to improve your business outcomes. Awesome. Sorry, so sorry, you guys. We are right at the top of the hour, so we, we do were need... on a roll. We were on a roll. It's okay. Oh, well, but, we uh, to talk uh, about uh, analytics-driven culture next month. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get the questions over to you so we can get that in the follow-up email, which will go out by end of day Monday for this webinar. And I hope you can join us next year. Um, as they, uh, Kelly and John just mentioned, we've got a, a, the next one is keys to creating analytics-driven culture. Um, it's a great presentation, and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged and asking such great questions. Again, I'll get those over to John and Kelly to get in the follow-up email. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you Thank so you much. Bye -bye. Happy holidays.